Now, I, I mentioned automatic semicolon uh, insertion before. It strikes again in this context. If we have um, a statement which begins with a parent, and if the previous statement did not have a semicolon, then the two get run together. Um, the, the, uh, the way semicolon insertion works sometimes in JavaScript is the compiler is going along, and if it gets an error and sees that there is a line feed nearby, it turns the line feed into a semicolon and then tries again. That should make you go, oh, man, that is, no, really? Yeah, th that's like bad, man. You don't want to be depending on, on something like that. Um, so the, the rules for how that works are well described in the ECMAScript standard. And it also gives examples that look very similar to this one of how it fails. It doesn't fail every time, but it fails quite a lot. Um, and as we're doing more and more uh, stuff in a functional style, the failures become even more common. So my advice is never rely on automatic semicolon insertion. It was put into, it was a good intention. It was intended to make it easier for beginners to write in the language um, because they weren't always sure where the semicolon should go. Had Brendan had a couple more days, maybe he would have invented a grammar for the language which was semicolon free, in which case uh, they would be optional in all places, not just in some places. Um, if, if, if that had worked, it would be a better language, but he didn't get to do that. Um, so just because the feature is in the language, and even though it works some of the time, you probably don't want to be using it. Uh, another uh, good intention was the with statement. Here we have a with statement of object O um, over foo equals coda. It's going to expand into one of these four statements. Can anyone predict which of those four statements it expands into? Uh, I'm sorry, it's a trick question. It could be any of them. <laughs> it could be any of them. I guess every answer is a right answer. Um, there's no way you can tell by reading the program which one it will expand into. And in fact, every time this statement executes, it could be a different one. So we're trying to approach perfection. In order to be confident our programs are perfect, we need to at least be able to read the program and, and determine what it does. In, with this construct, you cannot do that. Um, so I recommend not using it. Don't use the with statement. Write the thing it expands into instead. And in this example, it'd actually be smaller. Um, now, a lot of really clever people have worked really hard at trying to find places where they can do useful things with the with statement. And I recommend, no, don't use it ever. Because I'm not saying that it isn't useful. I'm saying there's never a case where it isn't confusing. And we really don't want to be confused. Confusion must be avoided. When we think that the program is doing one thing and it's actually doing something else, that confusion is where bugs come from. And we're trying to be bug free. We want to be as perfect as our limited intelligence will allow. So we don't want to intentionally make it harder for ourselves. You know, JavaScript has this double equal operator which does type coercion before it does its equality comparison. And so as a result, you can get some really surprising, um, uh, uh, stupid things happening. Um, fortunately, JavaScript also has a triple equal operator which always does the right thing. It will produce false for all of these comparisons. Um, so you can predict what it's going to do. These results are not random here. They're actually very specific rules which govern what this operator does, but they are long and complicated, and not many people can remember exactly what the rules are. Um, so I recommend always use triple equal. Uh, don't bother with the other one. Even in cases where double equal actually accidentally does exactly what you want, don't use it even then, because the reader of your program is now going to have to ask the question, did he find the one case where it actually does the right thing? <laughs> or is it an error, because it's usually an error? Uh, you don't want people asking those questions when they're reading your program. You want them to instead be focusing on what the program does. So if there's a feature of the language that is sometimes problematic, and if it can be replaced by another feature that, that is more reliable, 
always use the more reliable feature. Good trade-off, no cost, clear benefit. This is a new feature of the language, multi-line string literals. Other languages have had this for a while. This is new in JavaScript. I think this was a mistake. I think we should not have added this. Um, I have two problems with it. The first one, it has to do with indentation. Indentation is really important in this language because we're nesting a lot of things. We're nesting objects, we're nesting blocks, we're nesting functions, and indentation is uh, the form that we use to help explain to us quickly how all of this stuff is related. Without indentation, programs become meaningless. And multi-line string literals break indentation because the thing has to go out to the margin, um, and so it, it clearly makes the program more difficult to read. And anything that makes it more difficult to read is going to make it more difficult to understand. But worse than that, much worse than that, is the syntactic hazard. So here we have two statements that look the same. One of them is correct and the other is an error. Can anybody spot the error in the second statement? Yeah. There's a space right here. It's obvious once it's pointed out, right? <laughs> so I don't use this form because I want my programs to be obviously correct. And you cannot tell, looking at this statement, if it's correct or not. Um, there are at least two other ways of writing long strings in the language. I'll use one of those. In the next edition, we're going to have quasi-literals, which make this completely unnecessary. So I don't need it. C can't afford it. Avoid forms that are difficult to distinguish from common errors. Uh, this is something that was wrong in C. Um, it, they got it right in Java and then it skipped a generation, um, it, but we got it wrong in JavaScript. So the white statement looks like it's doing what the red statement does, but it is actually doing what the green statement does. So when you encounter this in the code, you have to stop and ask, OK, what's going on here? Um, is, is this right or is it wrong? The only thing you're confident of is that the programmer is incompetent. But beyond that, you're not really sure what's happening in the program. So my advice is figure out which of those two things you meant and write that instead. Um, make your programs look like what they do. Don't make people have to guess if you got it right or not. Um, scope is one of the best inventions in the history of programming languages. It came from Algol 60, which was one of the best designs in the history of programming languages. Most languages have block scope, which means anything in the curly braces that's defined there is not visible outside of it. JavaScript doesn't have that. It has function scope, which means anything declared anywhere within a function is visible everywhere within the function. Now, it turns out block scope is sufficient for writing good programs. And so we can still write good programs in JavaScript, even though it doesn't have block scope. The problem is that JavaScript syntax was modeled after languages that did have block scope. And when programmers come to JavaScript from other languages like C or C++ or Java or C Sharp or lots of others, they get confused. They think that block scope is available there, and they'll write constructs which can sometimes be wrong in an environment in which uh, block scope is not available. Um, this is um, due to something called hoisting. In JavaScript, you, uh, you declare variables with a var statement. And every var statement gets split into two parts. The definition part gets moved to the top of the function. And it gets run before any of the rest of the code runs. So you may think that you're declaring a variable within a block. Um, but you're not. And even worse than that, you might declare the same variable twice in two nested blocks and think that's going to be two different um, variables because of block scope. But both of those get hoisted, but no error is generated. So it's, um, that's bad. Um, so in a, in a block scoped language, the best advice is to clear the variable in the outermost common block at the first site of use. That's really good advice in Java and lots of other languages. It's bad advice in JavaScript because of this hoisting thing. So in JavaScript, I recommend declare all of your variables at the top of the function because that's actually where they're going to be declared anyway. 
And if you make your program look like what it does, then it's less likely to cause confusion and people will read it correctly. Um, there's a similar hoisting thing that happens with functions, and so I also recommend, for similar reasons, define all of your functions before you call them. The language allows you to be sloppy about that. I recommend not being sloppy about that because you can avoid some sources of confusion. The place where I find this is the most difficult for most programmers is the for var statement. Um, my advice is don't use for var because the variable is not scoped to the loop. It's scoped to the function because it gets hoisted like it does every place else. And I've seen people say, okay, I'm okay about doing it every place else except here. And they get really upset. And, eh, and go, but it's not doing what you think it does. But I've got to write it that way. Well, why do you have to write it that way? Because that's how you write it in Java. I say, write in the language you're writing in. <laughs> JavaScript isn't Java. It, Java has a completely, or not a completely, but a very different set of bad parts. And so the conventions you use for writing in Java are necessarily going to be different than they are in JavaScript. So pay attention to, to where you are. It's maybe unfortunate that all of our languages are so similar syntactically. It makes it difficult to sometimes remember what you're doing, where you are. Um, so in the next edition of, of the ECMAScript standard, we will probably have a let statement. And the let statement will be just like the var statement, except that it will respect block scope. It will not hoist out of blocks. Um, so when that happy day happens, which might be next year or maybe later, we don't know for sure yet, my advice will be stop using the var statement. Don't ever use it again. Use the let statement exclusively from now on, unless you have to support IE6. <laughs> or IE7. Or IE8. <laughs> or IE9. Or IE10. And we don't know about IE11 yet. M Microsoft hasn't announced what's in it. But if you only have to support IE12 and up, yeah, then you'll want to use the last statement. Global variables are evil. Um, they, they cause reliability problems, performance problems, security problems, so you don't want to use them. Unfortunately, JavaScript in its current state requires that you have global variables um, because that's how compilation units are able to uh, interact with each other. There's no linker, so everything runs together in a common global space. So because you can't avoid global variables, you want to have as few of them as possible and I want them to stand out. So I write my global variables all in uppercase because I want the reader to know this is a dangerous global variable. This has consequences. Um, don't ignore this variable because this is, this is dangerous stuff. In other languages, um, all uppercase means different things. You know, for example, in C, it means it's a macro. Um, but we don't have macros in JavaScript, so we can use this convention for something else. Um, JavaScript has a new prefix, which is the way it creates um, new instances of, of pseudo classes. Uh, unfortunately, the mechanism by which new works um, is, like much of the language, deeply problematic. I, in my own practice, I don't use the new word anymore, ever. Um, but it's still pretty popular. Um, one of the deep problems with it is if the user of your pseudo class forgets to put the new prefix in front of the constructor, instead of creating a new object, your constructor is going to be clobbering global variables. And there's no compile time warning, no runtime warnings, just bad, bad things happen. And so that's not good. Fortunately, this got fixed in ES5 strict mode. You'll get an exception in this case now, which is better. Um, it'd be even better if you got a um, compilation error, but you don't. But at, at least you get a runtime warning. Um, so be, because of this problem, we have a convention that constructor functions should always be named with initial caps, and nothing else should ever be named with initial caps. That's the only visual clue we have as to what requires new and what does not. Now, in other languages and in other platforms, um, initial caps means something else. But again, in JavaScript, that's not what it means. Um, here's something uh, that I see all the time. 
Um, the, the first statement looks like it means what's in red, but what it actually means is what's in green. So um, the, the author here thought he was defining two local variables, but he's actually, one of them is actually a global variable um, because of implicit global variables in JavaScript. Um, so again, this is one of those situations where you, when you see it, you have to ask, did he know what he's doing? Does he actually mean what this says? Um, we don't know. So again, my advice is figure out which of these you mean and write that instead. Write in a way that clearly communicates your intent. Okay, this one is maybe a little controversial. And I'll remind you that controversial does not mean wrong. So um, Thompson put plus plus into B in order to facilitate pointer arithmetic. Pointer arithmetic has since been uh, found to be harmful and uh, is no longer uh, finding its way into modern programming languages. <laughs> the last popular programming language to have this was C++, a language so bad it was named after this operator. <laughs> So the plus plus operator was implicated in the buffer overrun craze of the 20th century. A lot of um, security hazards were a result of the use of this operator. Um, because it was designed to be um, nestable, so that you can be doing assignments and pointer arithmetic in the middle of expressions, it tended to inspire programmers to write stuff which was way too compact. Um, you get really, really dense code and um, you, you get sort of, uh, well, I, I, I find in my own practice, whenever I'm using plus plus anywhere, I start to get this twitch, and I can't control it. I start trying to smush my code down and get it really small. Um, and that turns out to be a terrible trade-off, because there is no benefit to making the code smushed down and small, and there are huge hazards that come from it, because it's impossible to understand, and it's very difficult to modify and, and, and improve it. So um, in my own practice, I don't trust myself to use it anymore. I've completely sworn off plus plus. I don't use it. I'm free. And as a result, you know, food tastes better. <laughs> <laughs> so instead, I say x plus equal 1. I do that everywhere. If I got a for loop and I'm going to increment the, the induction variable, I'll say x plus equal 1. That's how I write it. And I hear all the time from people saying, no. I should be able to write x plus plus because it means exactly the same thing and it's one character shorter. That means you only have to type uh, uh, instead of uh, 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 uh. And that's so valuable. And it's, it's not. And, and, and it doesn't mean the same thing. Plus plus x means the same thing. So anytime I see someone writing x plus plus in the increment position, I have to go, okay, does this clown know the difference between pre-increment and post-increment? And this turns out to be a really subtle error. It's an off by one error, but it's only off for a tiny, tiny sliver of time. And finding one of these and correcting it is really hard. 